Hello and welcome. Welcome back uh, to the show, to the Church of Mark. Uh, we have Crystal Shawanda with us. What a great honor to have Yay. you here in the studio. Welcome. Thank you so much. I'm so happy that I finally got here. Awesome. <laughs> well, it's great to have you here. And you've been traveling a lot. We've been following your uh, your tours and your adventures all online. Yes. And even you guys went to Disneyland. <laughs> I get to live vicariously through you guys. So, right. so what brings you to the, I guess, the, uh, the GTA, the Toronto region? Well, we're actually here because I'm going to be performing at the induction gala for Little NHL. So, yes, yeah, so we're excited about that. It's been a while since we've uh, played Little NHL, and this is our first time doing the induction gala. So, yeah, we're excited to see everyone again. Excellent. And what night is that uh, that's happening that's this weekend? That's on uh, uh, Saturday. Saturday. Yes, okay. Saturday night, yeah. Great. I had to think about that. I always have to think because <laughs> I usually just, like, find out when I get to where I'm going. That's right. People try to ask my schedule, and I'm like, I don't know. Exactly. I'll find out when I get there. That's what happens <laughs> when you do a lot of shows, especially uh, we've just been doing a lot of touring, and people even ask you, what time's the show? I'm like, you know, I don't know. Yeah, I have no clue. Someone eventually <laughs> will come get me from my dressing room and tell me uh, when to go on stage. Exactly. That's right. yeah, I try yeah. not to worry about those kind of details. That's right. <laughs> Excellent. So after Toronto, are you heading back home to Nashville, or do you have uh, other shows? Yeah, um, we're actually going to head home to Nashville for a minute. And then we're going to fly over to Vancouver. I'm playing a celebration of love, actually, for my manager agent, mm -hmm. Rob Patty. So he's we've been working with him since, like, 2010, I think it was, was when mm -hmm. we started working together. So... Um, so he does he has uh terminal liver cancer so he says yeah it's been really really difficult we're in a it's like a weird limbo we're all in this weird limbo you know it's like you're trying to grieve somebody who is still here and and that's the whole point of this whole mm. get together it's mm -hmm. a, he's calling it a celebration of love his family mm. is calling it and um you know people always get together when you're gone and you don't get to see them that's right. and that's you know right. so they had this idea to have this get together beforehand before he started to feel real sick and it's a chance for everyone to come together and he says it's going to be a night of laughter okay and if anybody knows rob he loves to laugh and it's my favorite thing about hanging out with him is we we can just laugh about just about anything oh well, that's great <laughs> so it's going to be a night of music and love and laughter so so yeah so we're excited to go and do that and spend time with our friend that's very nice very nice so how long have you been living in Nashville for? It seems like quite a number of years now. Yes, it's been 21 years now. Wow, okay. Yeah, I know. It's weird. It's like I just realized I um, this year officially I will be living in Nashville longer than I lived in my own hometown of Weequemcong. So okay. it's kind of a weird, weird realization. It's like, like that's cool, but it's also like... I don't know. I didn't think I would be gone this long. Right, right, right. <laughs> that wasn't the intention when I left. So sometimes I get a little blue about that. Right. Yeah. Right. And what was it like? Feelings. Right. And what was it like growing up in Wiki? Was there a lot of musical influences? Is that kind of where you got interested in music? Yeah, definitely. In Wiki, there's always music. You know, they are always having. I noticed, like when I was younger, they had those kinds of things more, like variety nights, talent nights, talent shows. Um, you know, uh, what do they call those jamborees right. and yeah, yeah. stuff like that and um, just jam nights. And sometimes when there wasn't those things going on, people would get together in each other's basements and play music. Mm. And so for me, that's how I grew up. And my and I wanted to sing so bad. So my dad was always trying to help me find places to sing. So if he, you know, he had his ear to the ground all the time. So if he heard about you know people jamming out somewhere you'd be like let's go and so we'd go and i would just sit around and you know in the beginning it was kind of weird like people didn't know how to take me because everybody was a lot older right and i was just right. like this only little kid just sitting there jamming out with everybody <laughs> <laughs> and and uh you know but after a while they could see that i was really serious and so a lot of people helped me and encouraged me and and um that was the cool thing about wiki is there was always a place to sing Absolutely. Yeah. Because you guys started very young. And I remember reading a story where, because it was, you had to be a certain age to get into a bar and they kind of had to bring you in. <laughs> 
kind of like through the back door or get some sort of special permission or, yeah uh, for sure we did that was actually at reggie's tavern in okay. sault ste marie right uh we started visiting there just before i went into high school i guess i was about 12 years old and um we kept hearing about these singing contests that would happen at reggie's tavern and so we went in there one day in the afternoon and my dad introduced himself to reggie and introduced him to me and you got to hear her and he gave him one of my cassette tapes you know back in the day when we had cassette tapes, cassette tapes. that's right yeah yeah <laughs> so he slipped him a tape and and uh reggie was just really sweet and supportive and he said okay she can come to the singing contest but she's got to sit in the kitchen till it's time to sing and then she's got to run out on stage and sing and after soon she's done run right back to the kitchen and so and he let me do that i don't know if that was legal or what but we did it that's right <laughs> and it was awesome you know it gave me the experience to work with a band of musicians who are just a little bit more ahead of than what what i'd been working with and so right. it gave me a chance to learn um you know how to sing with a band and how to be more um you know competent on stage mm -hmm. so it was a good experience and also too it was being in that bar lifestyle it just kind of ready readied me for my future mm -hmm. <laughs> funky tonks so then how old were you when you decided to head down to nashville and start banging on doors to see about getting a record deal um well we started visiting it when i was 12. oh good. that same year um through one of the singing contests we found out about a producer who was from kitchener area his name was gary buck and he was living in nashville at the time and so um one of the guys running the singing contest slipped him our name and gave us his number and we called him up and we took a trip to nashville because my dad was a truck driver so okay. we just kind of all loaded up in the truck and went <laughs> and uh and just squeezed in there and and yeah we just kind of made that connection and we just kept going back and every time we would go we would meet somebody new or experience something new or learn something new and then i was just every basically every trip i was collecting information and ammunition and finally it was like i think i was 16 and i said to my parents i you know i've learned everything i can learn in school and i did the best thing best and worst thing i ever did and that was i dropped out of high school and decided to move to nashville before my last year and it was the best thing because it led mm. to my future but the worst thing because you know couldn't get a good job because i was a high right. school dropout right, right. and so one of those things you know and then so i was 16 and i made the move and i just started knocking on every door i could and i wasn't old enough to have a gig at the honky tonks yet so i busked on the street corners in the beginning mm. and and uh, kind of balance that with working at Chuck E. Cheese. Chuck E. Cheese, okay, okay, <laughs> right. You know, I've never been to Chuck E. Cheese. Yeah, one of the okay. few places right. that would hire a high school dropout. Right, right, of course. <laughs> so how did the deal, your record deal, come about with RCA? Because that was a big deal, obviously. Yeah, 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 yeah. for sure it was, yeah. Um, you know, it, it's, it, took a, it took a minute, you know, like when I finally started playing the clubs, I was 21. And um, I started, you know, I started off in the back room of Tootsie's and, and at that time, nobody went to the back room of Tootsie's. Now it's like jumping. Mm -hmm. It's like a hot spot. But when I was playing there, nobody was ever in the back room. <laughs> well, you made it popular, you see. <laughs> and, that's, and that's why they put me back there. It was like the owner was like, she's got a really good voice, but she's too shy to run the front room. So we'll put her in the back. And then that's where I met D-Wayne, my husband. He was playing in the band after me. They did the late night shift and that's when everybody would come in. And we started playing music together and writing together. And then we started dating. And then we just started building up this buzz. And pretty soon it became like a really popular place to be for songwriters. Hit songwriters mm. started coming down to listen to us. Publishers, producers, um, label people, even other artists would sometimes sit in the, like who were on the radio, would come in and they'd sit towards the back of the room with a hat on or something, but they'd right, be right. like listening and watching. And, and we knew they were there, but you know, you don't want to call attention to them because then they'll stop coming out. But it was just this buzz. It was really exciting. And a bidding war started off between several record labels and uh, producers. And I basically had my pick of who I wanted to work with and wow. chose my team according right. to you know history like rca records like that's elvis that's you know? right yeah, that's yeah. that's that kind of history you know and and my producer was scott hendrix that's who i chose because he worked on some of my most favorite records like mm. alan jackson and faith hill and and he's just he's known in nashville as being like 
I don't know, he had a bit of a nickname of like the Hitler of producers, you oh, know? I see. Okay. And I like that because right. I wanted to learn from somebody who is really who knew their stuff and who could teach me the most. And um, that's what I wanted. I wanted that kind of discipline, somebody to challenge me. That's what I wanted. And what was the first lesson that you learned from him? Um, pronunciation. Okay. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I was, you know, I was like, you know, this kid fresh off the res really still. And um, so I had really, you know, real res accent, resy accent. Okay. And um, the way I would pronounce things and say things. And, and then also, too, I was at the time listening to a lot of Shakira. Oh, okay. <laughs> who also... I think we all were at that time. <laughs> I know I was. <laughs> exactly. And, and it was her pronunciation, right? Because mm -hmm. English is her second language. And and so, um, so yeah, I had to work on my pronunciation. That was the first big lesson. Because I would, I remember when I was singing the word heart, I was saying yart. Oh. And then it was so funny because when he pointed it out to me when we were recording, he stopped recording and he's like, what's a yart? And I was like... <laughs> what <laughs> and he goes when you're singing heart you're actually saying yard and i was like am i and i just burst out laughing <laughs> i was like okay i'll fix that thanks i like i genuinely had uh, never noticed that before maybe it was yurt isn't it yurt one of those tents you know <laughs> so, so that was the first big lesson i learned okay well, pronunciation is important. It's all the difference, right? It really is yeah, yeah. because, you know, and I didn't think it was that big of a deal, okay. as silly as it sounds. But, <laughs> you know, if somebody can't, and that's something like, you know, as a producer, sometimes when we're working with artists, like pronunciation is so important because if they don't know what you're saying, they can't get into the story and then they won't love this song as much as they should. That's true. You know, this or they'll is all about sing the, story. the song wrong with the wrong lyrics like yes, most people sing songs i do i still do there's some songs <laughs> covers i used to sing back in the day at tootsies and you know we didn't have google oh, that's right yeah. so we had to write out lyrics by listening and writing them down and there was a lot of songs i wrote the wrong lyrics down and i still sing them the wrong way even though i have google search what's I'm the like, most memorable <laughs> um <laughs> Rhiannon, Stevie Nicks. Oh. I say a whole bunch of wrong He's stuff. Whole, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I've been listening to that song my whole life. And then later on when I had Google search, I'm like, oh, that's, that's what she's one. saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the that's the biggest one. Well, there's a big game show now. It's what's it called? Guess the next lyric or, or guess mm, the lyrics. So yes. basically they play a song and then you're supposed to guess the next line. Yeah. And you know, I, I don't know. I would be out in the first round. Me too. I, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Me too. I, even I should know more than I do. <laughs> oh, exactly. <laughs> so what's it like uh, living in Nashville? It must be exciting. It's a music town. Yes. You get a chance to go out and see, uh, you know, live music. And what's what's that kind of vibe like down there? It's it's like you said. It's a, it's exciting all mm. the time. It's a mecca of music and. <clears throat> what's really amazing about Nashville is that it's grown. You know, it's not just country music anymore. There is a music scene for whatever style of music you're into. It's there. You just got to find it. You know, it's not as obvious as just going to Broadway and there's like a hundred country bars, you know, it's like, you got to go and look for the places. They're there in town. There's great blues and jazz and mm -hmm. there's a really cool little pop music scene going on, you know, and, um, you know, Megan Trainer. that's where she started. That's where mm -hmm. she's from is Nashville. She grew up listening to the best of the best songwriters and learning how to write those hooky songs, you know? So it's like, it's exciting. And there's always somewhere <clears throat> to listen to live music. Like live music starts in Nashville at 10 a.m. and it goes till 2 a.m. And wow. a lot of these clubs now have several floors, three to five floors. And so when you go to a bar, it's like, Okay, we'll listen to this band for a while. Then we'll go upstairs and listen to this band. And you know, and each floor, everybody sounds great, and everybody oh, okay. sounds like they should be on the radio. And you know, and you're like, wow, why are you here? Why are you not famous? You know, because right. but it's just like the best of the best flock there, and you know, and and that's where it comes down to, like when people are out there playing. And there's a lot of songwriters clubs too. And so you kind of <clears throat> make your choice, you know, are you going to play the honky tonks or are you going to go to songwriters nights and do that scene? And then um, and, and that's where you find out where 
where what people are capable of and how you know how much discipline they have because you're around the nightlife all the time and so some people get caught up in the nightlife right. and they start partying a lot and they're afraid to say no to a gig because what if they never get offered another gig and somebody else takes it right right, right. <clears throat> so a lot of people build up nodes in their voice and people end up having to go home because they've lost their voices it's you know it's like you have to that's where it's everybody figures out who the survivors are and right right, right. you know it's, it's kind of yeah. like the weeding out process yes. in a way right absolutely right, right, right. Okay. <laughs> so but it's but it's amazing though you know a lot of talented people and um a lot of history Right. Yes. And now, cool. are a lot of the people in Nashville not from Nashville? Kind of like most of the people from Toronto are not even from Toronto. They're from other parts of the world or other parts of Canada. Exactly. Mm. It's very rare to meet somebody who's from Nashville. Right. Like, I think I've twice I've oh, met okay. <laughs> people who are from Nashville. But uh, the record label I used to be with, RCA Records, um, one of the radio guys, he was born and raised in Nashville. Oh, okay. And everybody always used to be like, he's actually from Nashville. It oh, was wow. like a real big talking point. <laughs> okay, oh, great. Right? <laughs> yeah, it's pretty crazy. And uh, do you ever see yourself moving back to Wiki or to the community or you're, uh, you've set your roots now down in Nashville and that's um, where you're at, staying? Yeah, at this time I'm, I'm in Nashville, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, anything's possible in the future, but right now I'm, Nashville's my home, that's where my work is. It just makes sense, you know, our, that's where our studio is and <clears throat> we're pretty set up with a mm -hmm. really awesome team that we like to work with. and. And, you know, and even though you can always record somewhere else and send the tracks back and forth, sometimes after a while you start to feel that in the tracks, you know, right, and right, right. Um, we did our last album like that, Midnight Blues, because it was during the pandemic. Right. So everybody recorded their parts, the guitar player, the bass player, the background singers, everybody did it, their parts in their own studios and sent it back to us. And, and the album sounds amazing. You would never be able to tell that. But, you know, this time around, we're working on the new album and we're in the studio together with everybody and everybody's mixing ideas. And it's mm. like, oh, yeah, right. this is what we've this is what we need to organic, get back to. more organic, more live. Yeah, totally. Right. Yeah, and yeah. even like these past few tracks we recorded, sometimes, you know, the drummer would have an idea that totally changed something in the song. And that wouldn't have happened if we weren't in the same room together. Exactly. Yeah. Right, so. Right. So that's one of the things that's, you know, kind of keeps me anchored to Nashville right now. Excellent. And with the studio, you're also helping out other artists. Uh, we had uh, North Sound on the show last month, uh, and you have other artists that you're recording. And so how did you get into helping uh, and producing other artists? Um, you know, it just kind of started where someone would approach us mm. and ask us for help. And um, it just kind of started organically that way. You know, we were already producing ourselves. And so we just kind of started doing that and helping out who we could, where we could, and, you know, learning as we go. And it's trial and error. And, <clears throat> you know, it's different when you're producing somebody else because when you're producing yourself, you have your vision right. and you stick with that. And then, but when you're producing somebody else, they might have ideas of their own. Maybe the vision isn't the same. Right, right. And so sometimes we have to do a little convincing, like just trust the process and let's see what happens at the end. And if you don't like it, then, you know, then you don't have to like it. <laughs> and right. you could, you know, right, and we'll right. try something else, you know. Um, but it, it's it's one of those things, but we, we really enjoy it. We love helping other artists and helping develop them is what we try to do is give advice and teach them as we go. And, mm. you know, the whole point for us is not to anchor anyone down. We want to give them the tools that they need that they can go on their journey. And after working with us, they feel a little more confident in their musicianship and their professionalism. And, um, you know, that's the point for us is we're not like, stay here with us. We're like, yes, go fly. You know, you, you're good enough to do this. So mm -hmm. do it, you know, take what you've learned, find other people to work with, learn what you can from them and, and just keep doing that. You know, the more you learn, the more you grow, the better you get. And the more you can carve out a place for yourself in the music scene, because you know, just because you're not signed with this label or you're not with this agent, that doesn't have to define the career you have. You know, right. you decide the career that you have. And as long as you don't give up and you just keep going, you know, you'll right. have a career 
and you Absolutely. and you can be happy with your little sliver of the pie you know that's it's right. like it's just great to have a little sliver of the pie <laughs> it seems like that's true it seems like there's too many artists out there are, are quite a few of them are focusing on being famous <clears throat> rather than building a career exactly those are, those are two completely different paths I always yeah. tell people, well, you should be focusing on the career. I mean, you can be famous, uh, but that's not going to probably last forever. Yes. Uh, as it never does. So when it comes to producing, do you find producing your own stuff easier than producing other artists or the other way around? Because I know sometimes artists lack you know, objectivity about their own art, but <laughs> maybe not so much about, say, if they're producing uh, someone else. Oh, yeah. You know, I think it's easier to produce somebody else for me anyways. Um, because I'll pick myself apart when I produce myself, I'll never be done. I'll just, right. I've actually stepped away the last couple albums and I've just been letting D Wayne produce me because I like having somebody else's point of view and I respect his point of view and he knows what I like. And he also knows my voice so well. So I trust a lot of his ideas and his vision. And I'm kind of curious, like, oh, where's this going to when D Wayne comes up with an idea? Because sometimes it leads to a very different place than where he starts it off with. Um, you know, but when I'm working with somebody else, it's just fun to make somebody shine, right. you know, to help them realize these are your strong points. So focus on this. And it's exciting to see them when they realize what their strong points are and they start running with that, the way they bloom, that's really exciting to watch. Absolutely. Yeah, I love that. That's and then, great. But with myself, mm -hmm. like I said, I'll just keep picking myself apart for right, right, right. like it'll never end. I think all <laughs> artists do that to some level, for sure. For sure. <laughs> now, we've been in the business, you know, uh, quite a number of years. Uh, we're not going to say how old we are, although some of you know how old I am. But uh, so what sort of changes have you seen happen? in the indigenous music industry specifically over those years like we've overcome some challenges but then we have new challenges uh with this sort of modern day age so what kind of challenges uh do you see like you know maybe future musicians might be having or even current uh, indigenous artists in the industry um you know what like i think a lot of the changes i see are like kind of like how i mentioned earlier is when we were younger, they had, you know, they were always having variety nights and variety shows. And that was an opportunity for us to own our craft and really get good at it and get comfortable on stage. And I think today, sometimes I've met some artists who, you know, they're online and they have a presence and TikTok and Facebook and Instagram and YouTube and reels and like that, but they've never really performed live on stage. And and if they have, it's only been in one type of atmosphere, but there's all different kinds of atmospheres. You know, you're, you're playing, you, you could either play to bars, you could play to theaters, you could play to festivals, and you have to learn how to, you know, bend a little bit to mm -hmm. cater to those different audiences. It's a different vibe, I don't know how to explain it, but you know, that's just it. If you haven't had that experience of having to um you know play to different styles of audiences that i think mm -hmm. that could be a, a challenging part is you know how do we take it from social media to live on stage for people and give them a show that a professional would give right you know i think that 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 time to salt and pepper themselves is you know to season themselves is is kind of lacking and it's not their fault it's just the opportunities are not quite as there you know and i think because of social media people aren't as bored and they're not as looking for places to go and listen like i'm bored oh, i might as well go check out that variety show see what everybody's up to right right no they're just gonna sit at home and sit on their couch and look at facebook and see what everybody's up to that's right you yeah. know so yeah, it's, yeah. so it's low attendance with and i see it all the time with um, within my own community, they'll advertise an event mm. and sometimes it'll be um, poor attendance, you know, and then I also see it sometimes when we play indigenous music events and, you know, you visit some communities and the organizers have worked really hard and they've managed to get this, you know, funding to put on an event and then barely any, anybody comes out to support it, you know, and it's just one of those things. It's like, oh, I'll sit at home and I'll watch somebody will go live on Facebook you know yeah <laughs> so yeah, that's yeah. that's one of the biggest changes i've seen um and then you know a, a beautiful change is seeing more presence all the indigenous representation on mainstream music scene Absolutely. that has been really beautiful and incredible to watch happen you know like um 
are so many out there representing today. And so it's that's the most exciting change I see. And, you know, just hoping to see even more of that. And and we if we could get to a point where it's no longer having, you know, the token indigenous person representing, right. but having, you know, us just weave in to the fabric of music, the music scene in Canada and beyond, you know, that's, that's, right. that's, I would love to see even more of that. So I think we're off to a good start right now. It's a, it's a good place. Absolutely, absolutely. Because it would be nice, like you said, to be more in the mainstream sort of focus, especially when it comes to festivals. I know some festivals have their indigenous stage <laughs> or their air tent area, and that's where usually we get assigned to play. For but sure. it would be nice to see more indigenous artists, of course, on the main stage. Definitely. Uh, to have both. Right. Yeah. That's they, right. I'm not saying like we shouldn't have those indigenous stages because... They're still um, very valuable, Absolutely. Because, sure. yeah, yeah. you know, what I always say is, you know, as indigenous artists... When we decide to play music, we have three choices, right? We either play um, mainstream music, which is important because representation matters, mm -hmm. or we play or we do um, uh, traditional music where we keep our culture alive and teach, which is important because we're keeping our culture alive, but we're also teaching our younger generations that we're important and That's we right. matter and who we are, the essence of who we are matters. And then you have your third choice of doing music like activist music, where you're, which is also really important so we can raise awareness about indigenous issues. So those are our three choices. And I always say not any of them are more important than the next. Mm -hmm. They're all important and essential. And I think all of those styles should be supporting each other more. Sometimes I see a lot of division where um, some people who do traditional music will say that the people who are playing mainstream music are lost. Mm. But it's hard enough as it is to be mm. representing on a mainstream scene. We're already getting hate. We don't need hate from our own people. That's right. And then just as well as mainstream pe people who are doing mainstream music shouldn't dismiss how important it is to have our traditional music being kept alive. That's right. You know, so it's like, it's, it's, that's one of those things. I do see a little bit division sometimes on social media about, about that subject matter, so. There is a lot of division on different topics, for sure, <laughs> for uh, sure. especially as of recent. Uh, I guess the whole pretendian issue, too, that's been a sort of another challenge, I guess you could say, uh, in the industry, because I think, I like to believe most people are well-intentioned, when yes. they enter, enter the industry, but there's, of course, no matter what facet you're in or what genre, there's always people that try to game the system or try to get some sort of advantage. Uh, that's been happening in the academic world. It's also happened in the fine art world. And of course, it, the music industry is no, uh, we're not immune to that either. Right. So I'm not sure, though, really what the solution is moving forward in, a, in addressing that. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Or? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure what, what, you know, because... You know, it's funny, like when it's happening in, in education, like when school, um, when teachers are being called out for if they're not indigenous, mm -hmm. <clears throat> there's people who take legal steps to, you know, find out these truths and deal with them properly. But in the music world, there's nobody really to take that on and say, I'm going to you know, take legal action with this and hold this person accountable. Mm -hmm. It's funny though, because we have that, it's set up like that in other, like you said, in, in mm -hmm. the education world, there's a protocol that they follow if this happens, they know what to do now. Mm -hmm. But in the music business, there's nobody holding anybody accountable. And um, and so that's, that's a difference that I see in, um, you know, who's gonna hold them accountable or who's gonna take it upon themselves to say, you know, set up some type of protocol that this is what we would do if somebody is suspected of being a pretendian like i, I honestly don't know what the answer is it's just mm -hmm. it's it's an unfortunate thing that is happening because it's creating so much a division you know and with um you know the other term of defendians you know that's right sir. that's right yes yes <laughs> so it's like if anybody even you know starts a conversation then defendians come in and get really angry and i totally get that True. because i was a defendian too right. when you know i have been a defendian mm -hmm. of people but that's because I truly believed them. And it's happened to me a couple of times. I, right. you know, I've, I, I went on tour with another artist who, you know, I didn't know them that well. And I heard them tell their story a few different times, a few different ways. And then later on, 
you know, we show up to a show and there's a bunch of people boycotting our show right. because that artist was on the tour. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, right. and, and we right, want right. to believe in people. We want to sure. give people benefit of the doubt. And um, we sometimes wanna... people maybe get the wrong information. Maybe they were lied to as a child and they Absolutely. just grew up with that lie as well. Absolutely. And so and so it's happened to me a few different times with different mm -hmm. people I've worked with and known personally. And um you know, it's it's difficult to deal with because again, that's like grieving somebody that you thought you knew, right. and then now you know they're not that person anymore, and that's that's really difficult. And like you said, if it's an accident and they are going by a history that they were told their whole life, then it's not their fault. Um, but I think once it comes up, it's how they handle it that makes the difference of how somebody like me who believed in them would feel. So like if somebody said, okay, maybe I'm not indigenous and they take it upon themselves to learn the history and then they come for, come out and say, this is what I thought, this is why I thought it, but it turns out this is the truth. And, um, you know, but my heart is still, has always been in the right place. Then I think that's okay. Mm -hmm. I think, I, you know, I don't believe in canceling people out completely. Right, I think right, right. people should be given a chance to explain themselves. And, and I, I always try to, and I think forgiveness is important. Everybody's human and sometimes we're at our best and sometimes we're not you know absolutely and, and um and then sometimes people just feel so lost they just want to fit in somewhere they want to belong somewhere and there's such a strong sense of community and family in our indigenous culture mm -hmm. i've met lots of people who've always been like oh i wish my family was like that or i mm -hmm. wish i had that you know and and um and so yeah that's that's kind of how i feel about it but again you know i'm i'm not an expert on anything and um, but I do think, you know, some accountability should be there, like um, the way Crown lands. That's right. The way they handled um, yeah, was, their situation. That's right. It was nice to see Cody make that statement and Absolutely. kind of come clean. That's I, right. have a, yeah. I had a lot of respect when I read what he wrote. I believed him that he genuinely believed this. And once, you know, when we know better, we do better. And that's, right. that's exactly what he did. And I was really impressed because it takes a lot of bravery, a lot of courage that's to right. do that. And um, it's difficult, you know, and you, you might feel silly, you might feel embarrassed, but once you get on the other side of that, it, at least you're living your truth now, your real truth, and you can hold your head up high and know you did the best you could. Absolutely. And yeah. That's all you can do. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so we're coming up to the end of the show, and I always ask, uh, you know, guests this this question: If I was a young, you know, Indigenous artist, say I'm living on the res, or say I'm even living in Toronto, uh, and I'm, you know, I w I'm desperately want to get into the music business. Say I uh, maybe I wrote a couple of songs, and I know how to play guitar or piano or whatever my instrument is. What's your best uh, advice to that person? My best advice is do it because you love it, because it won't always it won't always be easy and it won't always be lucrative you won't always make a lot of money it's going to be a lot of ups and downs so in those times when you're playing to nobody or you're making no money if you love it you're still going to be happy it won't really matter and um and be teachable learn from people and have respect for the people who were there before you go and ask them questions and you know, sometimes I hear people say, well, they weren't respectful to me. Okay, then just go to somebody else. You know, some people are helpful, some people aren't. I experienced that growing up when I tried to ask indigenous artists who were ahead of me for advice. Sometimes they were discouraging sometimes, mm -hmm. but you know, when that happens, what I always tell young people is, then those aren't your people. Head in a new, new direction till you find your people. You know, one of my best, um, my favorite pieces of advice that I like to follow personally, I heard from the singer Cher. She said, in life, be like a bumper car. When you hit a wall, just head in a new direction. Head a wall, go in a new direction. As long as you don't stop, that's the whole point. Wow, okay. And so, and if you're always willing to learn from people, then you'll just keep getting better and you'll keep growing. Absolutely. And you'll know more and you'll feel more confident, you know, but if you know it all, <laughs> you're or just going to stay you the same. All, right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's I think that's the best, you know, and just don't give up. That's great. You know, cuz you know there's all different kinds of voices in the world. Some voices are big, some voices are small. 
but they're just as equally important. It's all in what you put into your music. Sing what you mean, mean what you sing. That is awesome. Great advice. Any um, you know emerging artists uh, that we should be uh, looking uh, out for, keeping our ears open for? Oh my God, there's so many out there. Well, please plug some. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I know uh, you're a big fan, of course, the North Sound. Yes, the okay, North right. Sound is awesome. They're husband and wife duo, mm-hmm. and and we just love you know the storytelling of their songs. Forrest is a brilliant songwriter. And their harmonies are just like, like Nevada, when she comes in the studio, she's like one take kid, you know, oh, yeah, yeah. with her backgrounds. Yeah. And that's not always easy to get out of someone singing that's backgrounds. That's right. No, that's for sure. Yeah. So, you know, they're fantastic. And then we've been working with Alicia Cayley. Mm. Um, she's an incredible singer from Ottawa area. Right. And she actually just, um, she's going to be on this seasons of Canada's Got Talent. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we've been, she's doing, um, she loves to sing all styles of music, but we just recorded a little collection of pop songs um that she's some of them she's written and uh, but yeah just an incredible voice like you know it's like adele quality but she can do all these other cool things with it as well and she's just young she's like 18 i think oh wow okay yeah if it's 18 or 19 i apologize Alicia. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Melody MacArthur, I've okay. been working with her. Yeah, she's really cool. She's uh, with on the cast of Bear Grease Live. Oh right, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah and yeah. then uh, then we were just writing with Logan Stats. A oh couple awesome, weeks Logan's ago. great. Oh, yeah, just yeah. amazing. Like probably you know hands down one of the most incredible vocalists out there. Absolutely, his, his vocal talent is just like monster. Like it's just capable of anything. It's it so commands good. the room when you hear him it. Play. Does right. it really yeah, does? Yeah, yeah. And me and D Wayne, we're just it's exciting when you get to you know uh, work. There's all like I said, there's all kinds of voices, and we've just never worked with one like his. So it was pretty cool. So we wrote a couple of cool songs, and um, one of the songs we recorded, and he asked me if I would do some backgrounds on it. So I did some little little seasoned it with a little vocals here and there so yeah it works it's a really cool like bluesy song which is a little bit of a departure for him for what he's been doing Mm -hmm. so um i'm excited to see how that goes for him well we can't wait to hear it any tentative uh release date on that we're not Uh, sure yet we're we're gonna we're gonna hand the production to him and it's up to him and his manager what they're gonna do and where they're gonna go with it okay and and, uh but we'll definitely be cheering him on we hope everybody checks all these artists absolutely yeah well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for taking the time. Uh, I know you guys uh, have a lot of stuff going on. you got a busy, <laughs> busy schedule. Uh, but thank you again. Thank you. We're so happy we finally got here. Thank you. Chimiguetch. Miigwech. And uh, <laughs> thank you for watching.